Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, first uh, plenary session of the morning. Uh, we turn from uh, economics, which we discussed in the plenary sessions yesterday, to security issues. Uh, Bob Nurek, who was supposed to uh, be the uh, moderator for this session, was unable to come uh, to Riga for family reasons. So my name is Hans Benendijk and I will be your uh, moderator uh, for the next hour and a half. The uh, topic uh, today is NATO after the Chicago summit. And to discuss this uh, with us today, we have a world-class panel with three uh, sitting ministers of defense. Um, uh, first, our host today, uh, Dr. Pabrix, uh, who is the defense minister of Latvia, uh, we have uh, Mr. Minister uh, Eide uh, from Norway. We have Admiral De Pala, who is not only the Defense Minister of Italy, but formerly the Chairman of the Military Committee. So he brings uh, special knowledge to the table today. Uh, next to uh, uh, him, we have uh, Ambassador Sandy Verschbau, who uh, was the U.S. Ambassador to just about everywhere, uh, and uh, currently serves as the uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General of the Alliance. And finally, we have uh, Professor uh, Julian Lindley French, who is a commentator, academic, and we put him on every panel just to make sure that things stay lively. <laughs> what I would like to do um, to start the discussion is to lay out uh, four propositions that, uh, and these are, these are my thoughts, to kind of shape the discussion, four propositions about where NATO is today uh, after the Chicago summit. And my first proposition would be that the alliance is in really pretty good shape. Uh, diplomatically, uh, politically, it has overcome uh, many of the divisions that were evident as a result of Iraq in the last decade. It has a new strategic concept. It has a new focus uh, on Article 5. Uh, its operations are uh, all relatively successful, counterterrorism, counterpiracy operations, the Baltic air policing, uh, success in Libya, uh, cooperating together uh, on ISAF and Afghanistan, uh, even with a common understanding of, uh, on missile defense and uh, nuclear deterrence. So the alliance is in pretty good shape. That's the first proposition. The second proposition that I have for you is that the so-called American pivot or rebalancing to Asia uh, should not disrupt that situation. Uh, I think most uh, Europeans accept uh, the pivot uh, as not a pivot from Europe. In fact, it is about the fact that the United States uh, and our allies are ending uh, two wars in the greater Middle East. There are new challenges in Asia. Uh, but it's not about leaving Europe in any sense, and we will have uh, uh, military assets here uh, into the foreseeable future. So the second proposition is that the pivot uh, should not affect that. My third proposition is that there is a problem in the alliance, uh, and it has to do, it's a spin-off from what we were discussing here yesterday. It has to do with the Euro crisis. It has to do with European defense spending. Uh, there are only four or five European countries today who spend the target of 2% of GDP uh, for defense. Uh, if you look at overall defense spending across the transatlantic uh, set of countries, um, a decade ago, the United States spent perhaps 50% uh, of the total defense budget. Today, it's 70 plus percent. European countries are cutting deeply. Uh, the first set of cuts were what you might call horizontal cuts, uh, taking bits and pieces out of the force structure, uh, creating a hollow uh, force in some cases. What we've seen more recently are vertical cuts, taking capabilities right out of their forces, entire capabilities. So we have a problem. Uh, and uh, Secretary, former Secretary of Defense Gates talked about a dim or dismal future for the alliance if this isn't solved. My fourth proposition is that at Chicago, the alliance tried to focus on this. Uh, with smart defense. And it was a very good step, a very good first step, using smart defense, pooling, sharing, multinational approaches to try to deal with this third problem. Uh, but it's just a down payment, 
That's my proposition. It's just a down payment. We have to go. We have to put smart defense on steroids, uh, with a much higher degree of cooperation of role specialization. And so, with these four propositions, uh, I would like to turn to our panel. Uh, either react to the four of them or uh, react to the general topic of uh, what you see as the alliance's position uh, post Chicago, Minister. Thank you. Well, it seems like those countries which are, are on the border with non EU and non NATO countries always have to be the first, also in the conferences. Um, as far as the topic of the conference, NATO after Chicago, uh, I, I would say that um, there must be some challenging sentences told, and I think that uh, NATO after Chicago, in my view, looks quite the same as it was before Chicago, despite of the good small steps which were taken in front um, and forward in this um, conference. Um, obviously, one of the positive parts was a um, guarantee for further uh, air policing in the Baltic region and also more stress on smart defense, but I think there is still a lot to do if we really want to say that we are now progressing forward to those challenges which we see in the 21st century. Uh, speaking about uh, also the name of this um, panel, uh, capabilities, enlargement, originalization, I would like to add one more um, issue of deepening our cooperation within the NATO because this is very much at the base of what we are calling a smart defense. And uh, for me, it's also a very difficult to avoid um, when I'm speaking about the future of NATO or today of NATO, it's very difficult to avoid the issue of regionalization. Because uh, in many times for last decade, we have been a little bit with an angst, with fear, seeing a regionalization as something like an alternative to the NATO guarantees for our security. And uh, there are reasons to think like this, but I don't think that these reasons are deep enough because uh, I think that in 21st century of NATO, we cannot uh, make NATO more efficient, more capable without uh, adding this aspect of better regionalization and cooperation within the region. Uh, and here I probably have to start with, with our own uh, Baltic Sea region or Baltic region. I think that, uh, first of all, uh, NATO was a very good initial signal for us to cooperate more. Uh, secondly, if we are looking to the Baltic countries within the uh, NATO structure, then these countries are probably the best integrated militarily integrated countries within the alliance and maybe also a number of our um, uh, colleagues within NATO still do not know that, but we are the most integrated countries. Uh, the paradox is that we are the most integrated countries, not so much because we stress our history, ex uh, historic experience of 39, 41 and 45, but we are rather the most integrated countries because of NATO, because we had to apply together, because we had to uh, jump like poodles in the circus, as our former president told yesterday, in order to succeed to join this alliance. Uh, and, but at the same time, also among our nations here in the region, we see the same problem, what is obvious among other Europeans, namely, we still try to compete with each other, and also our successes do not come so easily uh, as far as cooperation as we would like to see. So there is still a lot of issues uh, to which I can refer later if there is an interest, uh, what we could do to improve the Baltic cooperation. And I would also here add, um, since the next speaker is my, my, my friend Espen, I would add also the Baltic Nordic cooperation. I think that to speak about the Baltic region alone, it's already too small. We have to speak about the Baltic Nordic region possibly, uh, and, and hopefully also the Baltic, Nordic, and Polish, more common regional integration within the NATO. Uh, another aspect uh, which uh, you mentioned here, um, relationship between the United States and Europe, and I, I would say that here there is some kind of also a psychological difference of uh, people's understanding of military role. On the one hand, Europeans 
are willing to compete with each other and to keep their own national military planning, national development, uh, uh, national industries. But at the same time, there is some kind of a resistance to give additional funding, to, be, to give a, additional financial support for the military development. So we are in some kind of a catch-22, where on the one hand, because of the economic crisis, we have to reduce. On the other hand, we are still willing to develop, but we don't know why to develop. And, and one of hypotheses, what, what I can say is that uh, frequently among the European public, there is a view that, you know, we live in a different times than 50, 60, or 100 years ago. Nobody threatens us. Why do we need to invest in military? And here I would like to say that uh, knowing that European history is going at least 2,500 years back, can we ever mention a time when people were be they were waking up in the morning and telling, listen, nothing is threatening us, everything is fine, so we should, we should not invest in the military, we should not invest in defense or security. There were no such times before, and there is no such times also today. So my biggest worry is that uh, Europe is becoming less and less capable, less and less willing to speak about the possibility of NATO expansion, and uh, that uh, one day will make this European-American alliance more fragile because, honestly speaking, why should Americans pay for the security of Latvians, for the security of, of Germans, for the security of Lithuanians or somebody else? Why, sh why should they do that if we are not keeping our security on the um, level high enough? Let's say... Uh, for us here in Latvia, uh, we have even two hypotheses uh, which are uh, negatively affecting our public and they are not always brought only from inside. They are brought also to us uh, by media from outside as well. And the first hypothesis is that uh, we do not need military because simply there is no uh, conventional threat anymore. But the second hypothesis is that we are such a small country that we probably cannot defend ourselves, and we can't. And if we can't defend ourselves, why should we invest in something which is unreasonable? So uh, you have to fight here also with a view that actually also small military forces can do something for some period of time for some kind of crisis. And if you cannot answer this question, then you will not get a public support. And additionally, of course, uh, if you heard yesterday's discussion of, of our prime minister, uh, defense ministry here is facing another issue. On the one hand, we have been promising that uh, we are going to increase our military spending up to 2% in 2020, but I'm really challenging that because unfortunately, unfortunately, the Latvian GDP is growing. And when Latvian GDP is growing, to reach 2% is much more difficult than it is not growing. And, and here I'm coming to maybe uh, the last point not to take more floor away from, from my colleagues, uh, I think that if we want a successful smart defense, if we want a successful regional cooperation, which is assisting um, the increase of capabilities of NATO forces and which uh, assists uh, a NATO to be the uh, strongest alliance in the world, military alliance in the world, we cannot anymore avoid the question of NATO and European Union relationship. Unfortunately, this is a hindrance for security in our region and for our capabilities globally. And we have to find the way how to solve these grievances, uh, which are not allowing to basically merge these organizations and which are not allowing actually to cooperate us in the same way. And a small, small, I will stop now here about the UN NATO for, for future questions, and uh, a small ironic uh, sidestep in this regard. I also would like to say um, a little bit about our Baltic Sea region. I think uh, when I'm speaking about the Baltic and Nordic cooperation, uh, and I even would like to challenge sometimes this, uh, these um, definitions, I would rather say that I'm against the Baltic Nordic cooperation because I am for the Baltic Nordic integration, which is in my view as a definition something deeper. Here, uh, we on the eastern shore of Nordic countries, we are very much looking uh, on the developments in uh, our neighboring uh, Finland and Sweden 
because we think that, that uh, non-participation of these two countries in NATO alliance is actually limiting our possibilities of cooperation. So we would be extremely interested if also societies in these countries would be courageous enough to take these challenges in the 21st century and maybe sometimes answer positively for the sake of security of the Baltic Sea region. Thank you. Minister, thank you. Yes, thank you, Hans. A couple of points uh, to your opening remarks. Uh, first, I think it is crucially important that we connect the theme of yesterday's panel with today, the economic crisis in Europe, the economic crisis of the West, and a core ambition in these days must be to make sure that the economic crisis does not turn into a security crisis, which it could, at the very worst, if we actually had a collapse at the core, or at least if we are less able to defend ourselves against uh, some external challenge. And it's important to remember that NATO always throughout its history has had these two purposes. One is to keep ourselves together and avoid the renationalization of defense. It was crucially important when we brought Germany into the fold in the 50s and also in German reintegration. It was crucially important to have this broader setting. And in these days where we see in some countries uh, certain nationalistic trends, uh, uh, I think it's very important to remember also that purpose of the security community that NATO is. My second point is on the pivot to Asia or the rebalancing. First, I think we Europeans should be very clear on saying that it is perfectly logical that the United States puts increased emphasis on Asia because Asia is not only rising in importance in America's world, it rises in importance even in Europe's world because it's the same world. So we also have to relate to that geopolitical change. And I think that the, 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 the one phenomenon that we typically discuss here is the geographical change. But there's more to it than that. There is also a return of symmetry. We have for two decades been assuming that the only enemy we will ever have was an asymmetric enemy. It was somebody, it was a failing state. We were not afraid of states, but failing states or non-state actors. Well, uh, if the West is declining in relative importance, we should at least be aware of the potential of a new strategic competition between great powers who are modernizing on both sides. And that gives a rather different outlook than what was typical in the heyday of you know, unipolarity and the absolute Western dominance that we celebrated when some people even declared that history was over because it was won. So it's a return of symmetry, there is a return of strategic competition and an understanding of geopolitics. And all of this is actually entailed in the documents that underpin this pivot to Asia, but we have only maybe in Europe understood the more sort of geographical point. Third point is smart defense is smart. And uh, it's true and it's for real, but it's not a panacea. You can't shift from one day to the other and believe that you will have as much defense capability with 20% less spending, that takes many, many years. And it's actually quite costly to become smart. Uh, we have been in our country uh, trying to think smart even if we're rich, <laughs> in the sense that although we have increased budgets, we have concentrated resources, fewer bases, more focus on key capabilities. And it's actually only after several years that you can see the synergy effect coming in. So the assumption that I think some people have, and maybe not defense minister, but our finance minister colleagues may believe is that, you know, there's a quick fix. You can get the same for much less next year. Not true. It takes time and this has to be addressed. What I liked very much with Chicago was that Chicago was the first summit for many years where NATO was the main topic. Uh, in, in previous summits uh, for several rounds now, we've had one particular mission as the main topic, but now we actually had a more uh, introspective look at what, what is the state of the alliance, what is the state of Article 5, and to be very honest, Article 5 is not faring very well. Article 5 is about credibility among ourselves, credibility to outsiders, and certain realities. And I think the perfectly understanding, understandable adaptation towards sort of asymmetrical, far away, expeditionary, light, deployable, uh, which was necessary and remains necessary, 
also comes at a cost when it has to do with the ability to meet sort of the 21st century set of challenges that has to be addressed as well. And, uh, and then to end uh, this first round, I very much agree with uh, Artis, as I almost always do, uh, on the uh, Nordic-Baltic uh, integration. I think it's an uh, even better vision than just cooperation. We now have the Nordic countries, including Finland and Sweden, despite of the fact that we're, they're still not members of NATO. They, are, uh, they have the same approach to NATO as Norway has to the EU, which we do everything the EU does as long as we don't have to make go to Brussels and vote. And this is also the Finnish-Swedish approach to NATO. And it works. This, maybe the alternative is better, but it works. There's a lot you can do anyhow. It has been expanded increasingly to the Nordic Baltic Club. And now we also have the Northern Group, which uh, includes um, Poland, um, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, United Kingdom, uh, often also with visits like when Sandy came uh, and when he represent, still represented the US. A uh, very informal gathering of countries in NATO or close to NATO, which is trying to take smart defense to the next step, because smart defense will normally not to be you know, projects among everyone. It will be projects between two, three, four, five smaller groups of countries doing things together that they didn't do before, or doing things together that they always have done with each on their own and are now merging. It's buy the same platforms, have the same maintenance line, do the same training, all these things where you can actually get some economic, uh, economic effect. And I, will, I would like to just congratulate our host, Latvia, not only you know, the organizers of the conference, but also because having followed Latvia particularly closely since we have a, a partnership that we established many years ago in, in, in Afghanistan as well as, well as at home, I think Latvia is an example to follow for country, because I believe that Latvia, when it now comes out of the very deep crisis, it will actually have used the crisis in a smart way to rebalance, restructure its armed forces. So it got rid of things you probably should get rid of, and it is investing in things you need more of, and, and it has been a smart approach to a very difficult situation. And I, I sincerely mean that, and I would like to say that in this context. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think you were suggesting on the American pivot that this should be seen uh, not as a pivot from Europe, but a pivot with Europe. Yeah. Admiral. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me start from the, the rebalancing or pivoting issue. Yesterday we, we were told that is rebalancing is not pivoting. And I think it is a fact of life. It's the U.S. is not pivoting or rebalancing because they want to pivot away from Europe. Because in the, this in the interdependent, globalized world is a fact of matter, is a fact, and you like it or not, is a fact that Asia is becoming a dominant, a relevant, rising player, not only China, Asia. And therefore, if you have your security interests to take care of, you have to look at this reality. And this uh, inevitably, inevit and rightly, let me say rightly, is questioning, is calling the uh, U.S. to rebalance which does not mean that they are rebalancing away from Europe, but they are taking care of what is a new area of rising challenges and rising geopolitical weight and, and economic dominance. But this is also true for us, for Europe. Why? Is not Europe as a such? Yesterday there was a lot of discussion about Europe, European Union, the political, what is the vision of this uh, vision of, of Europe? Is not Europe as a very sizable uh, economic and also value entity is not uh, dealing with, uh, with rising uh, China, with rising Asia. Yes, it does. So is a reality. So we cannot think of regionalizing or not, uh, refocusing or not. The issue is, is that what, what is NATO? What really is NATO? NATO is a community of liberal society, democratic and free with certain value, which have decided, and rightly so, uh, in, to secure this value. We want to secure them, we want to protect them, uh, we want to defend them, we want there to be this value that we want to be sure that they are secure. That are true, but to secure this value today in a globalized world in which the panorama of security challenges also the geopolitics, even the symmetric geopolitics, as Pernod was referring to, is change, is to take stock of this. We can, Article 5, I don't question Article 5. It's fundamental, it's the cornerstone. We will keep repeating, even to, to obsession. 
But the point is, what does Article 5 really mean? It means we want to protect our value. And we protect our value from the reality of today, the one that we come tomorrow. We cannot protect for something that was existing 50 years ago. That is a fact of life. And so therefore, when uh, the, the Alliance fundamentally tried to open this debate with the, the new strategic council in Lisbon, has done, has done a work of reality, of reality check of today. In this reality check, the financial crisis is an, an unavoidable question. So we can cry as Minister of Defense, whatever we want, give us more money, otherwise we will not protect your security, we will not protect your well-being. This is not going to happen for the foreseeable future. So if we are smart, it's not smart to say we have to have more money, otherwise uh, uh, we will not be able to do our job. The, our job as smart, if we are smart Minister of Defense, is to do what? To try to do the best of we can with the money we got. Certainly, we will continue to make uh, the case for not uh, going any further, and maybe when the situation, economic crisis will recover, we will have a rebound also in the first spending. But now, our responsibility is to use the money we have, the best way we have, and smart defense, which I don't want to overplay, I don't overplay that certainly, and now I, I am critical also of the job I've done maybe in the last few years, uh, the way we are tackling smart defense uh, up to today in NATO is not probably so smart because it's, it fundamentally is a, is a bunch of 120 or 125 projects, many of them have nothing to do with really relevance of a capability, it's to do what, do something. Having said that, what does it mean, Ms. Mart? Let's take the right priority, the right capability which we think are relevant today and tomorrow, and even tomorrow more than today. And on that, let's like to focus our energy, our resources, scarce as they are, and the regional approach that uh, both uh, uh, artists and the we were we are suggesting is a way to do that. But, okay, it's a way. If it is a way for some country to come together and smartly put together resources, but on the right priority, that is the issue. On the right issue, on the right capability. Because in the end, it's nice to say, uh, we, we, we regional uh, here in the Nordic country, we want to, uh, to foster together our cooperation. But at the same time, and looking for the Baltic air policing, which is a, a flagship, we are asking for the other, from other to come here. So therefore, it cannot be just a, a way to say we cross ourselves in our regional cooperation. That's it. This is not, the, this is not what was NATO law about. It's, uh, it's really taking care of each other of our security problems, which are common problems. And that call into play, I think, the unavoidable question of what the European and the European Union want to do. Because in the end, in the end, I believe that the, the rebalancing issue of the United States is also, uh, and I think that was clear in the, uh, Bob Gates' famous speech in Brussels, in his departing speech, was quite clear. He said, look, guy, we will stay engaged in Europe. We want to stay engaged. We will remain engaged in Europe, but we are rebalancing. We have also limited resources. Also, our budget will go down. So we will have also to reshape our presence. And you, Europe, you have to do your part, because that is the way to prevent one day to wake up here in Riga or in Rome or in Madrid, wake up and you discover that America is no longer there. To prevent this, then we have to do our part. In this coming to play, I think the relation with the discussion of yesterday, the vision of Europe, which has nothing to do with against contradicting the, the lines. On the contrary, is, in my view, is the fundamental key issue to reinforce and to save the transatlantic alliance for the future. Because the transatlantic alliance, as a such, has two, two sides, two bridges, two pillars of the bridge. That's uh, by definition. And one pillar is Europe. And because individually, as a nation, especially when you, you're talking of, of not only of the big nation, but also of the smaller issue in Europe, alone they cannot do it, building a vision of Europe, including not only economical, which is the main topic of today's agenda in Europe, but also uh, the security dimension is unavoidable. We have to tackle this problem. We have to come 
together to a closer European integration on defense. And that will be fundamental for enforcing the transatlantic link, and that will be fundamental for the European also being able to foster those capabilities which are so much required for, to, for the new security challenge, including the geopolitical, symmetrical challenge Aspen was referring to, coming together, that is the solution of the problem. It's not, uh, it's not NATO versus European Union. Actually, it's exactly the contrary. European Union coming to a closer vision also of the security dimension is a fundamental prerequisite, I believe, to save NATO in the future. Sandy, um, your portfolio today includes smart defense. So you might say something about where you see it going and how it relates to regional cooperation. Okay, no, I certainly want to talk about that. Uh, and I f first wanted to say uh, it's an it's a honor to be on a, such a distinguished panel, and uh, uh, you're a very good stand-in for Bob Nurek, who I know has a lot of friends out here who uh, wish, they, wish he were here. Uh, I thought I, I agreed pretty much with all of your four opening points, um, but I think there's no grounds for complacency. We have a lot of work to do going forward from Chicago. When I was puzzling over the agenda for the conference and I saw this question enlarge or regionalize, it seemed to come across to me as suggesting that in an age of austerity, uh, NATO had to make a choice between looking, in, looking uh, outwards beyond the region or looking inwards and focusing primarily on Europe. And I think there's a danger coming out of the financial crisis, and uh, sooner or later Europe will come out of the financial crisis, that it will con continue to be preoccupied with tending its own garden rather than playing a, an active part again on the global stage. And I hope that is not the case. But I think when it comes to NATO, the choice between looking outwards and looking inwards is a, is a false choice. Uh, of course, NATO's primary mission will remain the defense of its, uh, of its members' security, and this will continue to require paying close attention to our region. Uh, for example, we need to remain engaged in the Balkans to, to finish the job in Kosovo and also help bring the whole region into uh, the European mainstream. We have to keep working on the relationship uh, with Russia while continuing to engage with other key countries to the east, such as Ukraine. But today's security challenges, such as cyber warfare, missile proliferation, and terrorism don't confine themselves to any one region, and so uh, neither can NATO. I think some have been arguing that with the completion of our mission in Afghanistan, or at least our combat mission in Afghanistan, at the end of 2014, uh, NATO's militaries will have earned a, a period of R&R, &R, of uh, rest and rebuilding. But uh, clearly, in the, just turning on the TV today reminds us uh, that we aren't going to have the luxury of ignoring what happens in other parts of the world, uh, in North Africa and the Middle East in particular. Uh, we simply can't stop the world and get off. So we may not be facing an existential threat these days, but uh, that's also really not the question. The alliance is still our best insurance policy in case an unexpected crisis occurs, and we saw that with Libya uh, last year. At the same time, even if NATO may not be the solution to every problem, uh, our countries clearly need to be ready, the alliance needs to be ready for whatever the f future holds in store. And I think we need to continue to make that case to our publics, uh, who may wonder why we have to keep spending uh, sufficient resources on defense. Now let me offer some thoughts on what this means for NATO in practical terms. Uh, what kind of alliance do we need in the year 2020 and beyond uh, as we go forward from the Chicago summit, which was indeed a good opportunity to focus on the alliance itself and not just on our operational missions. Now, first of all, as I said, because security is global uh, and insecurity far from our borders can uh, lessen our security at home, uh, NATO members are going to continue to need the capacity to project power beyond NATO's borders. And this isn't a a trade-off, I think, with Article 5. The forces we need to, to be expeditionary are, for the most part, the forces we need to keep Article 5 credible. And I think we have made Article 5 much more credible in the last three, four years in terms of contingency planning, uh, exercises. I think it's now more than just a piece of paper. Article 5 has been, has been backed up with real military capability. But I would argue that just as important in an era, era of global threats, uh, 
we need to add to our strength by reaching out uh, across the globe for partners in security who are prepared to help meet the new threats together with us. And fortunately, we found them uh, literally on all five continents. They include countries like Australia, uh, with whom uh, the Secretary General just signed a joint political de de declaration on future cooperation uh, a few months ago. We have Georgia, which is now about to surpass Australia as the largest non-NATO troop contributor in Afghanistan. We have Arab partners like Jordan, Morocco, the UAE, and Qatar, who uh, participated in our operation in uh, Libya. And of course, we have Sweden, Finland, Austria, Republic of Korea, and many, many more. So looking ahead, we need to not only consolidate, but expand our partnerships with countries in our neighborhood and beyond. Uh, we have tools that were developed under the Partnership for Peace that could allow us to help the countries in transition, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, to build transparent and effective defense institutions and consolidate reform. So I think one of the challenges for NATO going forward is to make its own contribution to ensuring that the Arab awakening doesn't turn into a, a more, more worrisome uh, phenomenon than it already is. Now, third, enlargement. Uh, at the summit in Chicago, uh, we reaffirmed the open door policy, and we had a very exciting meeting of our foreign ministers with the four aspirant countries. Uh, and I had the chance to visit all four of them uh, to review their cooperation with NATO and uh, discuss what they still need to do to uh, meet NATO standards. But I think that it, I don't need to convince an audience in Latvia that uh, enlargement uh, has been one of the alliance's defining achievements. Uh, but I would also make the case that the job is not yet finished. Uh, it was very visionary after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union to use the prospect of membership to help leverage reform and help to spread security, prosperity, and uh, freedom across this continent. Uh, we saw former adversaries become first partners and then allies, and they've now become security producers, as we see with Latvia and, and other forces uh, on the ground, contributing in meaningful ways to uh, the operation in Afghanistan. So if we can say that so far NATO and, e and EU enlargement uh, have transformed the continent, uh, uh, we have to keep the process moving. Uh, certainly, each aspiring member has to meet NATO standards, and it also, if it comes in, has to enhance our security. It's not just a, something for the partners. It has to enhance everybody's security. But still, the open door has to remain more than a slogan as we look to 2020 and beyond. Now, coming to Asia and the pivot uh, or the rebalancing, it clearly does, as others have said, reflect the uh, changes and the challenges uh, of that region. It's not a turn away from Europe, but a reflection of the increasing complexity of the, of the uh, issues there, the rise of China, and, uh, and it is literally what we say, a rebalancing of our military assets uh, to deal uh, with, with the problems as they present themselves. But uh, connect connectivity with Asia is not just in the United States' interest, it's in Europe's interest as well. But I think the more interesting question from the pivot is, is it going to be a catalyst for Europe uh, doing more for its own security? Uh, clearly, the financial crisis has made this more difficult, but we have to ensure that austerity today doesn't, in the long term, undermine our security by diminishing our military capabilities for the long haul, or, as, as you mentioned, Hans, uh, for even further widening the gap between Euro European allies and the United States to the point that it does become politically unsustainable uh, in the United States. So smart defense is part of the solution. It's not the whole solution, but uh, it's, it's about allies doing a better job in prioritizing what they need and specializing in what they can do best, uh, cooperating more multinationally to achieve common goals uh, and to do things that they couldn't afford to do individually. So it is a way to become more effective and efficient uh, while sustaining our level of ambition. Uh, and so it's off to a good start. Uh, at the summit, 20 smart defense projects were approved. Uh, additional ones are being uh, finalized and 
could, could join the list. These include important things like an interim capability on uh, missile defense, uh, new initiatives on joint intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, cooperative projects in areas like counter IEDs, uh, logistics, sustainment, and of course we've agreed to an extension of Baltic air policing, which uh, was smart defense before we came up with the, uh, with the slogan. Uh, so we, we're off to a good start, but we still have a lot of work to do. Multinational cooperation is by no means sort of the natural option that nations have chosen over the years. There are good examples, but it, it, it is hard. It requires sharing work that one might prefer to keep with one's domestic industries. Uh, it creates uh, political challenges, but, but it's worth the effort. And I think regional cooperation, uh, the Nordic-Baltic uh, cooperation, is indeed a, a standout in terms of what, what can be done when states pool their efforts on, on a regional level, and that certainly is an important dimension of smart defense. And I would agree that uh, we have to find a way to get over the institutional roadblocks to better NATO-EU uh, cooperation. Uh, and I think we're managing to get around the roadblocks to some extent through the contacts among the staffs and good relations between European Defense Agency and, uh, and the NATO uh, authorities, both in Brussels and at, uh, in, at Supreme Allied Command Transformation. But but it's, it's not enough. And uh, if the pooling and sharing and smart defense initiatives are going to be truly uh, reinforcing to one another, uh, we have to uh, be able to have a meeting in Brussels between NATO and the EU once in a while. Uh, so that would be my, uh, my, my sort of short summary of the forward agenda post-Chicago. Uh, we need a perspective both European and global. We need capabilities that are flexible, deployable, and uh, and technologically advanced enough to, uh, to meet both the traditional and the non-traditional threats. We need partners both in Europe and around the globe to expand the uh, community of, of shared interests and values uh, that NATO represents. So that's sort of my vision of the NATO 2020 that we should be working for. Uh, Chicago kind of launched us, but uh, there's always a danger that uh, as soon as the heads of state and government turn their backs, uh, we lose momentum. There's a little of that creeping in, in Brussels even uh, over the last few months. So we have to uh, uh, keep up the pace. And uh, I think a lot of high-level political interest is going to be needed from, uh, from heads of state and government, from ministers, to ensure that uh, the, uh, the processes to implement all the Chicago decisions don't get bogged down, uh, as they sometimes do in NATO, as I've learned now in my third assignment. Uh, in Brussels. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Julian, uh, a lot on the table already. I wonder if in your comments you might uh, uh, make uh, some references to uh, NATO's global role, one of yeah. Sandy's points. Yeah. Uh, and is there a, a contradiction or a tension between that and Article 5? And then secondly, uh, we were talking earlier about what you have called uh, NATO's uh, defense fundamentals and how that relates to the first point. Yeah, thank you, Hans, and, and good morning, everybody. Great to be here in Riga. Great to share this, this wonderful panel with my friends and colleagues here. Look, I'm going to speak as a NATO citizen, you know, one of those people that you lot defend, um, <laughs> and who also, by the way, pays for this thing. Um, <laughs> do you know that film Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, um, where he keeps waking up in the same day over and over again? I kind of feel that I'm in Groundhog Day when I listen to NATO discussions. I think we are being strategically complacent in the extreme. Um, we're hearing all the right language. Sure, we always hear the right language out of, out of NATO. But behind that, the traction, the relationship with reality, I would challenge and I would genuinely question. Um, let me take Hans's four points, questions, direct head on. But I'd like to add one more. Does NATO pass the Riga test? Can the honest people of Riga sleep safe and secure in their beds that NATO is doing its job for them? And my answer is, today, yes. But I'm not so sure about the future. Why? There may not be any clear and present danger out there. But let me tell you this as a historian. All the conditions exist for hyper-competition between states. All the conditions, energy competition, 
many of the emerging powers in the world, their elites are legitimized not by democracy, but by growth. They need to keep growing to make sure they stay in power. This will push competition to a new level. And we should be under no illusions what that means for the reordering of power. We are witnessing the reordering of power. At the same time, if the Americans are standing on top, atop a fiscal cliff, let's, let's be blunt about this, Europeans are standing atop a defense cliff. Uh, we are in the great European defense depression. And behind that, I saw that when I was involved with the, the UK Strategic Defense and Security Review. There were many of those who were saying we have to cut the defense budget because of austerity. But make no mistake, there were an awful lot of those behind that argument who were soft power warriors who did not believe in the use of hard power. There's an ideological debate within Europe about the very nature of influence in this world which until we address directly and place the role of armed forces in the broad gamut of influence, our armed forces will be used as cushions to fund other weakening programs. So make no mistake, this is a very, very important moment indeed. So, Hans's first point, and I'm going to my fundamentals. The alliance is in good shape. Well, only if we do not address the real issues. Um, yeah, we can produce great summit declarations, but we all know that the fundamentals haven't really been addressed. And one of those is trust. I come from a country who's paid a very high price, like this one, in Afghanistan. The people I speak to in power, as I do, I'll tell you, they don't trust many of their European allies. Because we've done too much of the dying in Afghanistan. Now, you might disagree with me, but that's how the perception is in the United Kingdom. I believe it to be the same in, in the US. So why then should we invest in a system that we can't be absolutely certain that when there is a crisis that our allies will be there alongside us taking risk? Who did we work with in Afghanistan? The Americans, the Australians, the Canadians. Oh, they all speak English. The Anglosphere. Now I want to put something on the table to you bluntly. The reordering of power is also taking place inside Europe. And there is a profound dissonance over strategic concepts, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how, of the use of power between, say, Europe's new emerging power, Germany. And Germany, by the way, is a great savior of Europe, modern Europe in many ways. I'm, I'm, I'm really not German bashing my German colleagues. And the United States. So unless we can find a true strategic concept where we do agree on those fundamental questions about the use of force, I see us going round and round in circles. When you add that to the Euro crisis and my own country's fundamental position that we will never join the Euro and we will never join the Euro, then I can see a new dividing line going right down the channel where you have a defense Anglosphere as one pillar and a Eurosphere as the other pillar of NATO. And that could be a very profound reordering of power and, uh, inside the alliance that we have ever seen. And don't underestimate the possibilities of this because the cost to the UK and the benefits, the balance between the two of EU membership are becoming simply un unsupportable. The US pivot. Right now, it will not have an immediate impact on NATO. But may no, make no mistake, as my colleagues have hinted at, this is about the progressive shifting of America's center of gravity to Asia Pacific because the US has to. America today is like Britain in 1890. Hugely impressive on paper, stretched thin all over the world. Now the Americans might say to we Europeans, we have no intention of leaving you guys in the lurch. But let me tell you this, they don't control their destiny. What happens in Asia Pacific, particularly in East Asia, will define the world order as much as what happened in Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries defined that world order. We Europeans need to be aware of that. And that raises a further question, the fundamental question that NATO faces today. Is NATO a way of guaranteeing America's continued defense of Europe by organizing credible force in support of the United States global mission? 
or is NATO a group of regional actors that will be credible in and around Europe to take the pressure off the US so the US can be credible where it needs to balance in Asia Pacific in the 21st century. The way we're going right now, we are doing neither. We are neither credible in dealing with our own neighborhood as Europeans, and let's face it, it's a pretty rough neighborhood with all the issues on the table, and very few of us, apart from we British who are building two new super carriers, HMS highly unlikely and HMS quite improbable, um, we are moving to support in some way the US strategy. So now might look quite sanguine, if you like, for NATO. But as we approach the end of Afghanistan deployment, 2014, the whole question of NATO after Afghanistan is the real issue here on the table, and that is directly linked to American grand strategy about which we are very complacent. The situation we're in right now is very, very simple. We Europeans are saying we want more autonomy. We've cut our defense budgets on average 30% in the last four years, and by the way, very badly without proper cohesion, we're forced to rely ever more on the United States, which is so overstretched that they're having to look elsewhere. This is strategic pretense, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it. Um, the Euro crisis versus Euro defense spending, well, I kind of touched on that, uh, on, on the issue of, not just the, the issue of cuts, but the issue behind it of the ideological uh, uh, questions in Europe about the role of soft power and hard power, so I won't dwell on that. And Hans's final point on the issue of, of smart defense. There's a simple truism in defense. You do not get more from less. You get less from less. Um, and however smart you are, unless you have a genuine strategy, a defense strategy, you will end up being weak. Now, I've just come back from Beijing had some interesting chats with the, some of the Chinese intelligence people. Wow. What they say. <laughs> what they say about us. You should go there. You might come back somewhat sobered. And what was fascinating about that was how they saw power. Power was classical. It wasn't all this postmodern rubbish we have in Europe these days. Um, it was classical state-centric power. It was about spheres of influence, about islands in the East China Sea. And what struck me about it was that their sense was that China, or Europe is weakening so fast that Russia, which also has spheres of influence in its mind, will try to, at some point, reassert those spheres of influence. Let's face it, the neighbors across the road aren't exactly the most, uh, shall we say, open of, 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 of partners. Those people, if we are not careful, it is they who will define the rules of the game of the 21st century, not us. And if they define the rules of the game of the 21st century, it will be a game in which there are balances of power and spheres of influence. And if spheres of influence reassert themselves, then I would wonder, could NATO still pass its Riga test? At some point, we are going to have to grip those fundamentals. And that, even for Article 5, as, as Han suggested, means a contemporary 21st century collective defense. Not the classic collective defense. Even collective defense requires advanced expeditionary forces. It requires cyber defense. It requires missile defense. It requires the credible defense of the home base to achieve that absolutely necess necessary commodity in this age, influence and we are retreating from it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll finish my remarks uh, on, on, on that point. I'm grateful to my very senior colleagues for having the courage to confront some of these issues, but I'm going to leave you under, under no, uh, under, with no hesitation whatsoever. This is a very dangerous moment for the Alliance, and unless our leaders grip the reality that I have laid out there, then I, as a citizen, will be let down by you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I have an announcement for Anna Jartfeld. Your car is waiting out front. <laughs> um, I must uh, we, uh, as as uh, we had uh, mentioned uh, yesterday in, this, in those plenary sessions, we have 
uh, a group uh, called the Young Diplomacy Professionals who are also uh, listening to this debate, and uh, I have questions popping up from them. So I have two that I'd like to ask of the panel that come from this group. And uh, as I'm doing that, if you could uh, prepare your own uh, questions for the panel, we have uh, a little bit more than a half an hour. The two questions uh, that I have from uh, this Young Diplomacy Professionals Forum <laughs> Uh, first has to do with smart defense, and Sandy might take this on. There were two related questions. One is, is smart defense just an excuse for spending less? And Julian was touching on that. And a related question from the same group was, um, is NATO smart defense and EU smart defense compatible? Uh, the second, those, so those are a related set of questions for Sandy. And then the uh, second question had to do with the regional cooperation uh, and, uh, uh, Artis, if you could take this one. The question is, if the threats are not regional, uh, why should we take a regional approach? Sandy, you want to go first? Well, Sandy first, and then... Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, first, uh, I want to thank Julian for, uh, for the cold shower he gave us all. Uh, you know, I, I, I would say that you, you point to a pretty dark future, which... Uh, we have to avoid, and uh, you know we won't let you down <laughs> as a citizen. But uh, but it will uh, require some hard political decisions, and uh, this defense cliff that you described uh, is a danger. That if we come out of the financial crisis and defense spending doesn't come back up, there is going to be a limit to how much smart defense and other new initiatives can 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 offset what will be genuine damage to the, the net military capability of the alliance and the, and the political cohesion that flows from that. So, uh, so keep challenging us and we'll try to uh, prove you wrong. I will. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, on, on the question regarding smart defense, uh, I don't think it's an excuse to spend less. It's an effort to deal with a situation in which larger forces than, uh, than de any one defense minister can control uh, are forcing countries to uh, cut defense, and indeed it could have been done in a more rational and coordinated way. Um, we have to strengthen our defense planning process so that countries come to NATO before they make irrevocable decisions rather than after. Uh, that's easier said than done. And, uh, but it is an effort to, sort of, to achieve an, a more efficient way of acquiring capabilities, of doing support and sustainment activities that are very expensive for each nation to do individually. Traditionally, logistics has always been done by each nation. If countries pool their forces, and to some extent they've been doing it in Afghanistan ad hoc, uh, it can lower the net cost of, of military operations. Uh, multinational acquisition uh, doesn't always save money, but I think it's a way of perhaps justifying defense expenditures at, 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 in hard times that may be less uh, convincing, uh, in, at least in some countries. So, again, smart defense, not a panacea. Uh, it will provide modest savings. It hopefully, will keep the capabilities flowing when, until brighter times reemerge. Uh, but the fundamental issue of resources can't be uh, ignored uh, when we look from now to 2020. Uh, so, NATO definitely has a strong stake in the successful resolution of the Euro crisis, uh, just as countries outside the Eurozone have a direct stake as well. Artists in the regional cooperation? Well, well, I think that in 21st century, uh, the regional and global threats, they're blurred. So obviously, for global uh, challenges, you cannot have a regional answers, and this is not what we offer. But I see the regional cooperation, regional integration as an important aspect, one, but one important aspect of smart defense. And obviously, here we come to the question, how do we define smart defense? And I'm definitely opposing those who would like to say that, okay, now we have a financial crisis, we have less money, so let's do something together and still keep something up. That's a wrong answer. In my understanding, smart defense means that we all invest in our increased defense budgets in the same way, and at the same time, we do it in an integrated manner. That's what is important, and, and this is a way how we can get an increased, better capabilities. For instance, if, we, if I speak about the Baltic countries, we, <coughs> sorry, all three countries have uh, 
basically the political wish and will to increase their budgets, but at the same time, with a smart defense, I would understand here, for instance, a common military planning for all three countries, because obviously threats here would not challenge just one of us. This always will be an integrated challenge for all of us. And um, by speaking about this combination of, of, of EU and NATO finances and defense, uh, I would like to just uh, refer to one of the uh, commonly known uh, knowledges about rich and poor. If you have a rich country which doesn't care about its defense and has this open door policy and next to it you have a poor but militarized country, this is just a question of time until these doors will be entered. So and this is where we see the this, this power structure changing and thinking, and here I agree with, 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 with Julian that uh, many of our neighbors, they think in traditional terms. And if, if we in Europe think in a very extra modern terms and think that there are no threats for us, we can decrease our um, uh, defense budgets, we do not care about security, then this is our problem because we think wrong. It's not their problem. So we are, will be unable to answer their challenges when they will come. And by that, I would say that we should not underestimate the influence of European identity crisis, of Europe crisis, not Euro crisis, but Europe crisis on NATO. Because if European Union fails now with the reform process, if European Union fails to bring their forces together, and I would call it myself a next step of better federalization or deepening of cooperation, then I'm afraid that NATO alone will be very stretched to endure this pressure of challenges if Europe fails. So actually, the NATO future, in my view, is very much today dependent on those, I would say also bureaucratic and political decisions what our European leaders will make. I, I know both of you wanted to comment. Uh, I've seen about 10 hands go up in the audience. So let me see if I can take uh, the questions in clusters of three. And then I will turn to the two of you, and you can comment on that and the questions. Uh, so, yes, uh, I saw the first hand back in the third row, fourth row. Yes, sir. Behind you. Yes. And then I saw over here. And uh, there, Hans, you were. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Ilter Turan from Istanbul Bilgi University. I really have two points to make to which the members of the panel might respond. Uh, the first one is about the underpinning, the maybe underpinnings of the, uh, smart defense. Is smart defense possible for countries that do not conceive their security needs to be comprised exclusively of NATO needs? In other words, if you have essentially nation states within the European Union that pursue other policy goals than just those that are alleged to be European policies, then is smart defense a possibility? This is question I'm, number one. I'm going to have to limit you to one question, if I might. Okay, put me on the list back again for the <laughs> second round. <laughs> Thank you. There are too many people uh, who want to speak. Sir, over here. Next question is on this side. We have a mic over here. Third question is over here. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I was calling from the Foreign Relations Committee in the Latvian Parliament. Uh, you've all touched upon rebalancing to Asia uh, and agreed that it's a logical step and that it shouldn't be uh, away from Europe, but it should be Europe together with the U.S. rebalancing. NATO is looking out at a multipolar world. Uh, should NATO be considering establishing a NATO China Council, just as it has a NATO Russia Council? Uh, Russia is the successor of what was once the main adversary of NATO. Some people believe China could become a future adversary. Would it make sense to start establishing a council and a dialogue? And so my question is, first of all, are there arguments for and against, and especially to Julian Lindley French, who just came from there, are they interested? Uh, would they be interested <laughs> in a council like this to promote transparency and cooperation? 
Hans Kundanani from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Just a very quick response to Julian. Um, I very much agreed with um, the points you're making, particularly about um, the way that some European uh, member states aren't putting their weight. Uh, I would single out Germany, which spends 1.3% of its GDP on defence. Um, but as a fellow Brit, I just want to disagree with you about your idea of the Anglosphere. I don't think that's a particularly helpful concept. Um, and to draw the dividing line between English uh, speakers and non-English speakers, um, lots of Estonians and Danes and Dutch uh, have been dying disproportionately in Afghanistan too. So we have three questions on the table. Uh, Hesman, you want to go first? We have uh, Smart Defense Beyond NATO, we have the NATO China Council, and we have the Anglosphere which Julian can answer. Okay. Thank you. First, uh, let me just say, a panel with Julian is always more fun than a panel without Julian, so thanks for, <laughs> thanks for challenging thanks, us. Good. And actually, on, I just first want to say, I definitely agree. My point also is there is a return of strategic competition, there is a return of symmetry, and that challenges the core assumption of the two last decades, including the assumption that the Anglosphere held so while you are right with the very important correction, there are others too. These countries, a, a group of countries performed really well in the Afghanistan type of mission. But what they also did was to move money from the high-end maritime capabilities, for instance, in order to focus on uh, light infantry, helicopters, uh, light fighting vehicles, and the stuff you need in that kind of a conflict, where, as what we're seeing now, may be an area where maybe the Navy becomes much more important. The Americans talk about the air-sea battle, uh, and if you look at where Pentagon now is cutting, it is very much on those precise capabilities that any, everybody in NATO, including the Americans, argued everyone to do more of a couple of years ago. So to understand what the potential adversary is, is an important part of the answer to what is smart defense. Smart for what? Smart for what purpose? And then to the question, uh, very quickly, from the audience. Uh, is smart defense an excuse for spending less? It shouldn't be. I think for some it is. Uh, but smart defense is smart whether you spend more or less. But it's even more important if you spend less. Because, as again, Julian says, if you spend less, you get less. But you can have more or less less. <laughs> because if... Uh, and, and the problem is, when every time those of us who promote smart defense say smart defense, somebody says, well, do you think we're dumb? Did we, did we do dumb defense? Well, yes, uh, in the sense that what countries typically do is to keep the bases, keep all the people, cut the investments and training. And what you then get is a, is a big structure on paper which looks nice in parades, but, you know, which is not actually capable. And if you have to cut, make sure that you keep your investment budget high and you keep money for training, and then rather take out capabilities or reduce bases. Now, most defense ministers agree with me on this. The problem is that when defense ministers come to their constituencies, uh, there's a mayor saying, not my base, because it's always been there. Uh, or not that type of event, not that orchestra, because it's always played here. And, and then what you get back is the defense, until you have a very strong leadership from the top saying, you know, my purpose is to do less of the less important things and more of the more important things. And that's true both for those few of us who actually are spending more, and it's true for those who are spending less alike. Admiral. I would like to, talk, to touch several points here. First of all, uh, repeat what has been said, which is absolutely true. Smart defense is not spending, uh, getting more with less. This is, Julian, you are right in your provocation. You are absolutely right. If you were a politician, would you be different? I mean, the <laughs> statements are right, the analysis are right, but then also the reality of, a, uh, of a handling, let's say, power is uh, another story. But absolutely, it's not to, to spend, to get more with less. It's to get the, the best we can with what you have, which is completely different. And by the way, I would like to remind you that you can get zero even if you have a 10. Because you have, have a 10 pounds and get zero, you have achieved two pounds, you invest properly, may you get two. So, uh, and we, a lot of us, certainly in Europe, a lot of us, even when we had 2% or 5% money, maybe we are spending not that much or not that well, much but not well, and now we are discovering that the, the capability or even the structure that we have in European armed forces are unfitted for the new reality. So that's one point. Second point, yes, it is true that the, I don't know if it's true if there's an Anglo, Anglo 
uh, formed divide in Europe or even in NATO, although it's clearly that when, when the United States, which is an Anglophone country, uh, although they speak American or, or English, like. but are certainly <laughs> the, the permanent uh, ally, inevitably they exercise influence. That's true. But I want to remember, because here uh, in Afghanistan, yes, it's not really, it's not fair, it's not honest to say, there is also a lot of Italian that have, have died. I would remind you, a lot of French, a lot of Spanish, a lot of German. And so let's dispel out this uh, issue, oh, uh, Afghanistan is just an American UK issue. This is a false statement. And by the way, uh, this is true a fact. Not only, for example, now I speak for my country, we are the fourth sizable presence in Afghanistan, even in the South, that you like it or not, but we are also in Lebanon, we are also in Kosovo, we are in many other places, so this is not true, first of all. And still, yes, we are not spending 2%, we are spending 1, 3 like Germany, and, but we, I suppose, we are providing a lot of capacity to the alliance. So, that's what I want to say. Third point, we want a debate now, Afghanistan, I see a debate somehow, open or not open debate, or Close NATO or outreach NATO? Retrenching NATO or not retrenching? Well, I think that in this reality of a globalized world, including the rebalancing and going to the argument uh, which has been raised by the Latvian parliamentarian, I think it would be a mistake to have a, a close NATO. We need to have an outreach NATO, which, why not? I don't know if we will have a NATO China Council. I don't know. But why not? If this should be the case, if China is interested, is, so, because we certainly have US China relations, we have European Union China relations. And in the end, what NATO is, is a, is a community which tries to protect the, the US European uh, way of uh, interest, also way we, we are. So uh, I believe we should argue against uh, a close NATO, but in favor of an outreach NATO. And that uh, has nothing to do with the regionalization. Somebody used the regionalization issue as a sort of retrenching within the retrenching in Europe. And I don't think this is the case of artists, I know. Actually, he said very clearly, but that would be a mistake. And another point. Yes, you are right. European has to have a debate. But what we have in today is, is the, exactly the wrong example. Because it's not us, it's not the Minister of Defense. I would have expected the Prime Minister, the head of the state yesterday, discussing the security dimension of Europe. If we rest among defense ministers discussing this issue, we go nowhere. This, the political dimension of Europe, including the security dimension, is an issue which needs to be tackled beside the financial issue at the level of the state. I would like to see Angela Merkel, Mario Monti discussing this issue. Not me. I cannot help much on that. Thank you. Uh, first, Julian, on the Anglosphere, yeah. can you limit yourself to that one? Yeah, because we'll we have a lot of questions, and then Sandy briefly. Yeah, very quickly. Um, you're trying to diss the idea of the Anglosphere by attacking me for being, showing a lack of respect to others. Uh, those who know me in this room know I have complete respect for others, but the Anglosphere exists. I've seen it in operation in, Ang in, in Afghanistan. I see it in operation <laughs> um, increasingly between the UK, the US, the Canadians, and the, and the Australians. Why? Because it's American defense strategy which is defining the defense strategies of those countries. I joked about the two aircraft carriers. The Brits are building two aircraft carriers, new astute hunter killer nuclear submarines, new Type 45 destroyers, new Type 27 destroyers. Why? Because post-Afghanistan, we are shifting from a land-centric back to a maritime-centric strategy in line with the US, and our continental partners are, are, are not doing that. So the Anglosphere exists. And, and one final point on, 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 on it, if I may, uh, Hans. Look, the Eurozone countries will have to deepen integration. There's no question of that. Even though I have profound concerns as a European about the concentration of too much power in too few hands in Europe. It's never been good when that's happened in Europe. But Eurozone integration will lead to defense integration. And frankly, with 19 EU member states spending less than 4 billion euros a year and very badly, it's not smart defense we need. We need real defense integration with these countries. We. Oui. Very. Right. Wait up. We okay? Yeah. To move the microphone. Okay. I think you. Okay. Um, I was going to take on the China Sandy, question. Yeah, Sandy, uh, just very briefly, because we have about 10 more questions. Question about should NATO establish a, 
a council with China. Uh, I think that's uh, something that might evolve over time. Right now, we do have a, a very limited but, but potentially growing dialogue with China, not something we've advertised very much, but there have been military staff talks, there have been uh, visits by uh, senior NATO officials, assistant secretary general level, uh, and so there does seem to be some interest in at least uh, finding out what NATO is up to on the part of the Chinese, but also a recognition that NATO is uh, still a key player that uh, affects in, in issues on which the Chinese are engaged uh, through the UN Security Council or otherwise. So, um, you know, a council may not be quite ready for prime time, but certainly having a dialogue with, with China may enhance predictability and, uh, and uh, you know, avert uh, at least some aspects of the competition that others have spoken on. I just want to say on this issue of uh, smart defense versus sort of national security agendas, mm. I think that we need to carry it out in a way that ensures that it, it is compatible. I think if a group of nations develop a, a particular capability, they need to agree among themselves that any one of those states could use that capability if it had to do something on its own or in a different coalition framework or with the European Union rather than with NATO. Uh, by the same token, we have to ensure that if one of the five countries doing a particular project opts out of an operation, which does happen, and that's a sovereign privilege uh, in, in NATO, that the other four can still use the capability. Otherwise, we'll have uh, some nice-looking capabilities on the shelf, but we can't use them. They won't be available in, in the real world. So these are some of the complicated political issues surrounding smart defense, but I think they can be solved, but it takes political will. Well, <clears throat> if NATO is not a regional but a global player, then I think that NATO-China Council is a very good idea because it's about diplomacy, it's about respect, and this is about real politics, in fact. And uh, second remark concerning the Anglo-Saxon world and activities, I think it's not so much about the language as about the <clears throat> size, capability, and visibility, because we should add here to Anglo-Saxon world, of course, such countries as Norway, Denmark, maybe also one day Baltic countries and, and Michigan, which is less obvious, but anyway, this is first about capabilities and possibility to do something efficiently is in about language. Thank you. Let me take uh, uh, three or four more quickly here. Hans, bring it with you. I'm sure that next year at the Riga conference, China will be not only talked about, but will be present. And I would welcome it, because then we could ask our Chinese colleagues whether they share our interpretation of their priorities, strategic priorities, aren't we just copying our own historical experience and transferring it to them? If I were Chinese and would make a risk assessment, and Julian, you may react to this because you have talked to them, I would see the world in the following terms. In the north, there's Russia. In the south, there is India and Indonesia, and in the east there is Japan and Korea. What is my strategic priority? Behaving like a European nation state, um, the product of the Westphalian Conference, or the peace? Not at all. My strategic priority would be to prevent regional alliances against myself, given the fact that inside my country, China, I have tremendous problems which require all the attention and resources available to deal with them. Yeah. It is not global conflict, territorial expansion, or anything like that. So put that on the agenda next year if you can't answer today. Thank you. Uh, down front here, question, and then third question. Yes, yeah, Artis Lange from the Latvian Parliament. Uh, we got a cold shower, but didn't Poland also get a cold shower when the defense missile shield was downgraded on the 17th of September, if we're talking about resurgent spheres of power? Uh, and doesn't, hasn't, this achieve, uh, hasn't this resulted in Poland shifting its American-centric attitude to a Europe, more European-centric uh, posture? Remember Radek Sikorsky's speech in Berlin? 
So uh, is, uh, even inside the European Union, you have th these shifts. If you're talking about regional powers, and Mr. Publix also mentioned. And I just would like to conclude with the ancient Roman adage that we are our worst enemies. We haven't talked about this, but look what that little film in California has done. It is even not only the tragic effects in uh, Libya, but also threatening the lives of our soldiers in Afghanistan. Third question here. Thank you. It's uh, quite a few years since the concept of Afghanistan being a make or break for NATO was coined. And to today, when three defense ministers hardly mentioned Afghanistan in their initial statements. Uh, so I, was, uh, I would like to ask you to reflect on what are the risks involved in the next few years as the process of withdrawal from Afghanistan yeah. may uh, create a, an image of defeat and failure and how to defend NATO uh, from that risk. Thank you. I think there uh, will be a lunchtime discussion on Afghanistan. Uh, I can take one more question, uh, hand that just went up, and then we'll have one round of responses, and then we'll have to close it out. Vladimir Sokol from Jamestown Foundation. Does NATO intend to act on the institutional level to halt the transfer of military technology and weapons to Russia? a process that exacerbates the imbalance of power between Russia and NATO's own members and partners in the East. Thank you. So we have four questions, one on China, one on Poland and missile defense, one on Afghanistan, and one on tech transfers to Russia. You want to begin? Can I do China? Yes. Take China? Uh, for, I am in favor of a NATO-China Council. I hope China also is in favor, otherwise it will not be very useful. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's true that the elite thinking in China is moving from soft to hard power. But that's a correct observation. We also see it. But, but that, it should also be said that the rise of China has empirically happened on a soft power basis. Investments, uh, loans, uh, keeping up the dollar... Uh, saving, you know, the U.S. from economic collapse. Uh, the, 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 the reality so far has been a soft power approach. But China is also going to learn, and I'm confident about that, that if you become too hard power-ish in your expressions, you will create counterbalancing. It, it's interesting when Vietnam is now suggesting a military partnership with the U.S. that was less in fashion some years ago, as many will remember. And, uh, and that is a reaction to Chinese behavior. Uh, and it is not empirically obvious that by talking more about hard power intentions, you get more influence. You can actually get less influence, as, if I may say so, the early Bush administration eventually also learned. So, so you know, power is a composite thing. A military is relevant, economic, political, but also ideological and idea power. And I think there is a, it's in the balance now how China is, uh, looks to its neighborhood. That our good advice in the China... China NATO Council is to share some of our own experiences about how you balance between hard and soft power. Uh, Julian and then Sandy, you might want to talk about missile defense. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to vilify China. I, I lived in Hong Kong many years ago, so gained some insight in, in, into the Chinese mind. The Chinese popular mind, such as it exists, is we will not be humiliated again. And, and at the moment, everything is going China's way in terms of its ability to exploit the consumer obesity of the West. But the West is in crisis. And do not underestimate the power of nationalism in China. And by the way, do not underestimate the influence of the People's Liberation Army over the party. There has been double digit growth in defense expenditure since 1989 year on year. And I, I have full respect for China. I think we're in the balance whether China becomes a competitor but let's not be naive. China could become a competitor. And, and the, the, the nature of the relations we have now with China, like a NATO-Russia council, could go a long way to deciding that fate. But the, the sometimes cuddly China rhetoric I hear in the West, you're deluding yourselves. Sandy. Okay, uh, <clears throat> first, just briefly on, on Afghanistan, I think that uh, certainly there are plenty of challenges and risks uh, between now and the end of 2014. Uh, but first of all, we're not withdrawing. We're ending a combat mission, but we'll transition to a follow-on mission to a smaller one that will train and assist the Afghans. And I think that 
we are on course. There's been some serious uh, uh, setbacks this summer with these insider attacks, but the overall strategy of building up the capacity of the Afghan security forces to take charge of their own, of securing their own country is, is working. It is on course. Uh, there'll be further bad days, uh, but we have to hold steady and recognize that uh, we, we can make this transition work. There are broader issues in Afghanistan, of course, relating to governance, rule of law, anti-corruption, which uh, NATO only has uh, an indirect uh, responsibility for. I think those are the bigger questions that will, uh, will need to be addressed. And of course, it's ultimately up to the Afghans to, to get a grip on these issues themselves. Now, on missile defense and, and Poland, uh, I have to say that uh, the way the, pr the question was framed basically is stating a myth. Uh, what happened in September 2009 may have been one of the less skillful uh, uh, exercises in, in uh, political consultation, and certainly uh, the media spin on the, on the day was not uh, what was intended. But the actual fact of the matter is the... Uh, system that was offered to Poland on that day is a better system. It's one that's now been adopted by NATO. It's instead of 10 ground-based interceptors in around 2018 that would have very little capability to defend Europe, and in fact, according to the latest NRC report, would have very little capability of defending the United States, we now are going to be deploying the European phased adaptive approach, which will put 24 missiles in Poland, which will provide extensive coverage of uh, Central and Northern Europe, in tandem with the systems on Aegis ships in the Mediterranean, which are already uh, deployed, and a site in Romania with another 24 missiles. We will have comprehensive protection for all of your NATO Europe, and uh, we will be keeping pace with the evolving threat from uh, countries uh, in the Middle East. Uh, that threat has materialized much more quickly when it comes to the short and medium-range missiles, and the EPAA deals with the threat that exists today. Uh, and it's, it is operational. We have a radar in Turkey that uh, reflects the importance that that country attaches to missile defense. Uh, so I don't think uh, Poland, at the end of the day, feels that it's been abandoned. If anything, it's playing a more, it will be playing a more central role in a NATO-wide missile defense system than would have been the case under the previous plan. Uh, as far as the broader issue of uh, shifting from US-centric to uh, EU-centric, uh, first of all, it's not a zero-sum game. Poland should become an increasingly important player in Europe. Uh, that's, uh, the, I think that's probably good for Europe. But uh, I think that uh, the, the US-Polish defense relationship remains very robust. Uh, the United States is setting up an aviation detachment in Poland to uh, support enhanced training and exercises, will be a, which will be an, a key contribution to keeping NATO fit and interoperable after we're less active operationally. Uh, so uh, I think one has to look at the big picture and not uh, rely on uh, bad headlines that uh, were uh, in the newspapers on the 17th of, sem of September 2009. Admiral? I would like to touch two points on two questions. One was on Russia and Afghanistan. Afghanistan was not the topic of today, and the, but as, as he said, Afghanistan, NATO is more than Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a major mission. We have already a plan not only to do down, but also to get engaged. We have a poor size of NATO engagement, and therefore Afghanistan will continue to remain a center of interest for the alliance. We will not live in Afghanistan. If we will succeed, as we hope we will succeed or not, that historian will tell us in 2050. We believe we will, but we are engaged, so therefore we have to go also beyond what's the case of Afghanistan and of Russia. I, I just remind you that with Russia we have so-called strategic partnership, but they even, even the strategic concept, even the Lisbon strategic concept say Russia is not an enemy. Having said that, although we are not naive, we don't say that Russia is a partner like Australia. Nobody is questioning that. But we're trying to establish a relation with Russia. And so the, as the, the statement has been done that the West is selling to the axemen the rope that will hang us is, is a joke. It's a joke. This is not happening. We are not halting any strategic balance. There is not such a massive technology transfer to Russia. This is not the case. Actually, it's the contrary. We, the alliance, as a 
union of democracy, still very powerful nation, still sizable military. We are still, I think, if I were Russian, I would be afraid, not if I were everyone. Last word. Well, I think that uh, Riga conference took a notice and uh, we would have to return next year here, here is a question of NATO, China Council and the China discussion. I think it would be very valuable for us here and all, all over. Uh, secondly, I think I, w I would say it's very difficult to sustain the soft power for a long term without the hard power. And I think this is what we can see here also in the European continent that now with this uh, identity and economic crisis uh, by eliminating step by step our um, hard power we also risk by losing our soft power globally as a European continent and looking to our region actually I, I can see that uh, there are countries which understand that soft power and hard power goes hand in hand for instance Russia as lately also Jamestown Foundation have been writing we can see that NATO Five paragraph, fifth paragraph umbrella definitely gives a good security uh, for our region against the hard power, but can it take away the shadow of uh, soft power coming from abroad? That still remains a question. Well, uh, there were still a number of questions that we couldn't get to. Uh, I would suggest that if you want to follow up privately with uh, panel members, you might come up and do that uh, in just a minute. Uh, but it is time to draw down the curtain on this panel. Uh, we've had a great discussion. And please join me in thanking this wonderful panel.